Welcome to day one of A New Wonder once again, a symposium organized in conjunction with the exhibition Latif Muhirin Pago Pago that is currently ongoing at the National Gallery Singapore until the 27th of September 2020. My name is Shabir Hussein Mustafa and I will be moderating the discussion today. Today we have the tremendous honor of chatting with three luminaries, Gunawan Mohamed, Idana Pucci and Terence Ward. Three individuals with whom we will explore the perennial figure of the wanderer in Asian philosophical and historical traditions. The wanderer is also a being they have encountered and embodied in their literary and activist work. By delving into their writings, we will trace possible genealogies of the term, from the paranta of the Malay world to the Darvish of Sufism and the sannyasi of the Indic cosmos. The wanderer is also a carrier of knowledge who sometimes exists at the margins of society but acts as a compass for human progress. A being all three writers have encountered in their travels and literary work, but also, if I may say, very much embody themselves. Wandering is a concept that lies at the heart of Latif Mohidin's Pago Pago. It is inspired from a mode of voluntary migration practiced by the Minangkabau communities of Southeast Asia called Maranta, whereby they leave the familiar behind in search of knowledge and wisdom from the world. It is also a concept that Latif Mohidin turned to in the 1960s when he encountered the complexities of the world as a young man studying art in Berlin. Europe was divided. He observed the rise of the Berlin Wall. Southeast Asia, a region that was only just emerging from centuries of colonial insults, was no exception. Latif Mohidin returned to Malaya in 1964 and decided to Marantau and develop a body of paintings and writings that he came to evoke as Pago Pago. A kind of sensibility, a kind of fever, an aesthetic impulse, a consciousness perhaps that emerges from the wandering of the body and mind. Moments earlier, we viewed the 1976 film Kalau Kau Mahu with an introduction by the poet Nabila Said. Titled after Latif Mohidin's 1969 poem, Kalau Kau Mahu, or If You Will, is scripted by Ismail Zain. The film features Latif Mohidin as a wanderer who communes with nature as he goes about his daily habit, as one that is between the mundane and the universal. Indeed, the wanderer's ways are very much lodged in the everyday and the human condition, as much as they engage with deeper philosophical ideas. This session is also titled after a poem by Latif Mohidin, written sometime as he traveled in the 1960s. Latif Mohidin is seated at a train platform. It is just before sunset. There are only lonely old pensioners who have worked themselves to an old age. They look at the tall buildings across the landscape as if trying to strike up a conversation with them. The wanderer in this case is also an observer, but also feels the pain and kindness of strangers. I'm gonna try and read a little fragment from the poem. They sit quietly in a row staring at the tall buildings across the landscape, studying the shadows of the skyscrapers, how they rise up towards the heavens. The daily train no longer stops at the platform where they sit, bathed in yellow light of the lamps. These retired folks just sit there on the bench in silence. Don't they know that a station that's usually noisy can suddenly be dead from silence? in the moment of sheer heat of a long journey. Today's conversation tries to go deeper into the kinds of philosophies of wandering that not only informed Latif Mohedin, but also continue to operate across Asia. And this is also not the first meeting of these three acclaimed writers. They have often penned thoughts about each other's work, shared sympathies, and even formed alliances. In fact, we have met before in the name of Pago Pago, 
when the exhibition was first staged at the Centre Pompidou in Paris in 2018. Then Idana and Perrin spoke with Gunawan and Latif Mohidin about the various worlds they navigated throughout the 1960s, thinking about what it meant to speak to modernism in Southeast Asian tongues. A link to that session will be made available in the description below. This conversation is a continuation of the inquiry that began in Paris, evolved further in Kuala Lumpur at the symposium How Easily Modernism Could Be Disturbed, when the exhibition traveled there to Ilham Gallery in later 2018. A link to the proceedings of that symposium too will be made available in the description below. Today, the conversation format will be free flowing as we think through issues surrounding the topic at hand. Along the way, we will meet philosophers and fellow wanderers from Rumi to James Joyce to Milarepa, the Tibetan mystic. In the lead up to this conversation, Terence offered an interesting provocation in relation to the central theme of the symposium. To think about the wanderer as forming part of a global view that rests in tension with mercantile networks that have navigated from Basra to Kowloon. The wanderer engaged in a form of culture making, whereby one is not programmed or guided by yet another neoliberal algorithm. The wanderer is in many ways a counter rhythm to capitalism. In the past weeks, as we prepared for this discussion, I returned to their writings, writings that are foundational in thinking about the issues at hand today, writings that have also had an impact on me as somebody who is working in culture. Let me begin with Gunawan Mohamed. I read and reread three texts in particular, On God and Other Unfinished Things, which appeared in 2007, Faith in Writing, 40 Years of Essays, and your most recent text, Traveling with God. Each essay and fragment offered a fantastic perspective on your journey in making sense of Indonesia, its 17,000 islands and the multiple worlds that connect them. Always moving, at times you are serious and pensive, sometimes comic, especially when you talk about pornography. There are even moments when you are nonchalant. In traveling with God, there is this fantastic moment. You are at the foothills of Jebel Musa, the mountain in northern Morocco, when you decide to whisper into the wind. A prophet once said, we have to get to the blessed promised land. At that moment, the desert laughed. The sea and the desert speak to the wanderer's miraculous face. And so after Gunawan Mohamed, I turn to Idana Pucci, whose work I've encountered more directly as one begins to engage with the story of Southeast Asian visual art. There is this incredible epic of life, which was first published in 1986 a text that unravels the multiple worlds that make up the ceiling murals of the Kartagosa temple in Klungkun, the former royal capital of Bali. I cannot help but read a brief quote from Idana's introduction. This book, therefore, should not be viewed as the ultimate wisdom on the paintings of the Kartagosa, although I do hope it will contribute to scholarship, but rather as the work of a storyteller fascinated with the wondrous mysteries of the human condition, with the wisdom transmitted through the ephemeral method of word of mouth, and in this particular case, through the word of mouth and image of the eye. When this singular event at, at a time and in place is over, it becomes like a dream or an illusion, living only in one's imagination. Idana, I'm going to ask you to talk more about the image of the eye in a little bit. Last and certainly not least, we have Terence Ward with his extensive meditations on the human condition. Like Idana and Gunawan, he works across multiple disciplines and linguistic frontiers. He too is a peripatetic storyteller. His book, Searching for Hassan, A Journey to the Heart of Iran, is an incredible story about him his siblings and parents on a journey to reconnect with a man they had lost contact with after the 1979 Iranian revolution. 
there is this review of the book that I would very much like to read. And I quote, searching for Hassan is a plea of for pluralism, attempting to narrow the cultural divide that separates the West from the Islamic world. In a time when nationalism and xenophobia are reaching alarming proportions, a novel so dedicated to transcultural exploration and integration is more relevant than ever. By revealing the humanity of a culture the West finds so threatening, Ward allows even the most bigoted among us to see past exotic names, the political clashes and cultural differences, to the deeper values that all cultures share family, history, and respect. Terry, you've often talked about the family of man. And just like Idana and Gunawan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come, come, come back to that as an idea. I evoke this quote in relation to Terence's provocation for this symposium, that if the merchant returns from foreign shores with goods, the wanderer returns with stories. For the wanderer, syncreticism is the norm, not the exception like a tailor of the cerebral who stitches different worlds together. In a way, Latif Mohidin alludes to much of this in his literary works too, in his poetry, to translations of Rumi and Umar Khayyam. And so in our conversation today, we will try and achieve two things. First, develop historicity around the figure of the wanderer in Asian philosophical, aesthetic, and spiritual modalities. It's a big feat. In order to do this, we will piece together different sources from works of art, writing, and poetry that Gunawan, Idana, Terry, and I have gathered together in the lead up to this conversation. Second, we'll pick up on the traditional, on, on the different moods rather, that Gunawan, Idana, and Terence adopt. Like Latif Mohidin's melancholia at the train station, these moods are important, not as a form of self indulgence but to think of how one can measure one's work against or within evolving times. It is a way to understand process. Perhaps the mood is a reflexive space, the image of the eye, the ability to see what is in front, but also beyond the horizon, whilst navigating history, legend, violence, ideas, and metaphysical concerns. So let us begin. And for this, I turn to Gunawan Mohamad. So let me ask you, you are forever wandering physically and mentally. Crossing a frontier often gives you new material. You also wander in the history of ideas, legend and myth, vertically and even horizontally, from one epoch to the next. As you enter a new land or a new context, what kind of an antenna sort of starts working? How, how do you begin? Does it begin with an observation? Is it curiosity? Is it seeking context? Maybe a frame of reference? How, how, how does it begin the moment you cross a frontier? Well, it's a good question. Uh, sometimes I don't really know what started started it. I, I'm, I'm not like Mohedin Malatif because I'm not to, uh, totally a wanderer. I'm not from Minangkabo tradition. They, they always leave the kampongs, the villages, because of this matrimonial system of society. The young people should go out from houses, from their houses. Uh, in Java, you don't do that. Uh, but yes, uh, what I was learn, learning for other people when there was a, and, and when I was very young, uh, you know, in, uh, in the 40s, I was born in 41, and the Revolutionary War in, in Indonesia, the, the Dutch troops occupied my, my city my town. So they executed my father and my brothers joined the guerrilla. So you have to move to the forest, to the jungle and cross other, other towns. And that's why we, I met a lot of people who are very, very kind. 
in spite of the hardship at the time. Uh, from, from that experience, I think my, uh, my urge to meet people is to, to, to celebrate kindness, uh, to celebrate warmth, which to me is the most important thing in relationship. Uh, uh, this one, when I travel, the first time I like to see the people, especially the people who smile. Uh, the, the most wonderful thing is about, thing about uh, what I see is when I see working people who smile to each other. That's extremely beautiful. Uh, because when, when I was in Russia, every time I went to a restaurant, the waiters didn't smile. That was during the during transition uh, uh, to post-communism. Uh, the first time I saw people smile was uh, in, in, I think in, Budapest, where people work and smile. That's beautiful. And that's, that, that, that gives me some addiction to meet people. I don't, I'm not a very sociable man, but person, but yeah, meeting, having friends, meeting people are uh, the joy. Uh, maybe that's why when I draw things, I do some drawing. It's about persons, faces, not things. And some, my, when I was studying psychology, my professor said, you, you really like people, don't you? Well, maybe that's true. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. I'm, 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 I'm going to ask you a, a question about your drawings, uh, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, yeah. but, but before that, I want to turn to Idana. Um, Idana, can, can you describe for us uh, your first encounter at the Kartagosa in Bali? I mean, um, how, how, if I may use the expression, how, how did you fall into the epic of life? Um, and, um, and, and maybe also about the image of the eye, Idana. I think, I think there, is a, there is a fantastic... Uh, uh, observation there, which which I think is is worth sharing, if I may say. <laughs> well, you use you use the word falling, and it's precisely that you know. Uh, actually, uh, the first encounter was in the late seventies, and uh, my eyes did not fall on the pavilion of Kertagossa. It fell on the cows grazing around on the grounds of the, of the former royal palace. And, um, um, you know, it was completely in the middle of this town, but uh, there were these cows <laughs> grazing uh, there um, undisturbed. And then there was this pavilion and I could see from the street that it was all painted. Um, and so um, anybody could go up, the, it's a high pavilion, anybody could go up. And uh, this is how I started to look at it. And I asked some information and they said, oh, this is the Kertagossa. And I said, what does Kertagossa mean? And it means um, a place where uh, matters of justice are discussed. And, uh, and then it all started from there, you know, um, in a big adventure, because I couldn't find anything in books. Uh, there wasn't a single um, source. And, um, uh, and they, so this is my first encounter. And so my research became, I became a wanderer because I had to use, well, I'm not an academic 
and I'm lucky because I'm not an academic. If not, <laughs> it would have become uh, probably a very um, cold experience and uh, full of dates and full of uh, impossible, uh, impossible um, information that also the Balinese themselves are very um, bored with and reluctant to give. And so um, my, my curiosity, because without curiosity, you cannot be involved in something like that from scratch, you know? And uh, um, it becomes a real adventure and you don't know where it's going to take you. And it lasted quite a few years. Now, uh, this is my first encounter. The image of the eye is, um, is something that sort of came out of my pen while I was writing um, the introduction, uh, be simply because uh, as, as the story is part of an oral tradition, uh, and um, so the oral tradition is a transmission from father to son, from grandmother to grandchildren, and so on through generations. Um, uh, it cannot be transmitted simply through sound, through the word, but uh, a good story has to have a, a very strong visual um, dimension. Uh, if not, the children fall asleep or it just cannot, cannot last in time. So um, one, for, the, for, for a, story, a story to be really uh, complete and have a lasting effect, it has to have a visual, the unity between the word and the eye and the image. Uh, thank you. Then, I mean, what, what you mentioned, uh, you sort of led us to uh, quite a fantastic kind of moment where perhaps I can, I can draw in uh, Terry uh, into the conversation. Mm. And, 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 and Terry, I mean, uh, 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 Gunawan once talked about um, the, 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 the moment of the encounter. Uh, yes. Right? And, and Idana has mm. kind of alluded to uh, orality right as a as a as a, as a very important uh, device mm -hmm. uh, but also something that the 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 wanderer kind of almost uh, mm -hmm. imbibes right a form mm -hmm. of osmosis you know, with with mm -hmm. his or her situation I I, I I i want to perhaps draw you into mm -hmm. uh, talking a little bit more about this this issue at hand today which is the perennial quality mm -hmm of the wanderer mm. uh, as mm. an artist as well mm. isn't it? i mean as a storyteller uh, yeah. the, the 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 poet or the bard you know the teller of mm. poetry uh, mm -hmm. but also uh, a kind of a performer of legends and myths mm -hmm. um, and, and, and in, in the lead up to this conversation mm. you you shared this fantastic quotation from rumi mm. uh, with me so terry could could you talk a bit more about this what, what you were mentioning, um, uh, Mustafa, the wanderer as an artist is a whole new domain because it's one thing, of course, to, to, to travel, to do a merental, to go to a different country, to go to a different world. The storyteller is the one who comes back with those, uh, with those as, as Ganawan was saying, those encounters where uh, where the kindness of strangers has really impacted. But more importantly, the storyteller was this extraordinary uh, entertainer. The, as you said, the teller of legends of myths, what Iran had just described with the Wayan uh, or the Dala, who would perform the Wayan. In a time before television, before films, People's imaginations were, 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 were heightened by, by these artists with this gift. So they were not only entertainers, they had to have a sense of drama. They had to have descriptive powers and they had to have a repertoire. 
there's this wonderful description where uh, Peter Brook, this um, uh, very famed uh, theatrical director, was in Africa. And he said he wandered into a village and he saw a whole group encircled uh, by a man. A man was sitting in the center with a box. And from that box were these holes. And from the holes were threads that all went out in different directions. And each person who wanted to hear a story would pull on a thread. That thread would indicate the story to be told, as if by divine intervention, call it what you will. But the idea of having that repertoire, where, in fact, the artist says, where would you like me to take you? Where can I lead you? What, what new land or, 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 or legend do you want me to recount? Where do you want to journey? And I think the storytellers in times where often people didn't leave their villages in the Middle Ages, certainly in Europe, there, there, there's arguments that sometimes people wouldn't leave uh, their homes and travel more than 10 miles in their lives. The storyteller was that trans, the, the person who would transport them. And, uh, and so if you, if you look at Rumi, um, this extraordinary character who emerges in the 13th century in Afghanistan, who flees because his father picks him up hearing that to the east Genghis Khan and the Mongols are galloping towards them and as we know in history very few people survived when the Mongols galloped through villages uh, often the entire <clears throat> the entire village city was put to the sword he found himself in a life of wandering and when he arrives in Tabriz, so now he would have left Afghanistan. His father has taken him into Iran. He's in northern Iran in an area called, uh, close to Azerbaijan. They call it Azerbaijan there. Um, there's this town of Tabriz. And what does he meet? But he encounters this extraordinary wanderer as well. His name is Shams, which is the old word for son. Uh, the historic word for sun. And this Shams is so possessed and such an extraordinary character that he transforms Rumi. Rumi, when he finally reaches Konya, is a very, very celebrated figure, one of the great poets of his day. Of course, working in Persian, which was a lingua franca of that area from the Ottoman world all the way to Delhi. Uh, but he dies in Konya. Now, what I would suggest is that, uh, is that his journey transformed him. It wasn't he that, that framed his journey. And I think that many wanderers and certainly many artists, people who write about their, their, their journeys, find that happening. So... Um, Gary Schneider, this, uh, this beat poet, uh, once wrote, he said, the closer you get to real matter, when he was talking about wandering through forests or on, on that marantau, as you would say, the closer you get to real matter, rock, air, fire, wood, the more spiritual the world is. Now, this is something that's desperately lost in the West that people are trying to recuperate. But in the East, it's always been, in, in Asia, it's always been absolutely integral. Uh, uh, and, uh, and when Rumi passes on, everyone celebrates that day, December 17th, today, not as his death, but as his wedding day, because he's returning to his beloved. So... Later on in life, he writes these words to give you an idea of how that journey transformed him. He writes, not Christian or Jew or Muslim, not Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi or Zen, not any culture 
or religion. I am not from the east nor the west, not out of the ocean nor up from the ground, not natural nor ethereal, not composed of elements at all. My place is placeless, a voice of the traceless, neither body or soul. I belong to the beloved. He's already anticipating that final journey. Having seen the two worlds, ours here physically, the other obviously, uh, the invisible world. Having seen the two worlds as one and that one to call to and know as a breathing human being, getting back to what Gunawan was saying, this, this intense uh, 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 reaction that he has when he sees that celebration of, of, of kindness and warmth. Uh, and, and so the journey for somebody like Rumi completely transforms him. Had he remained in Afghanistan, uh, none of this poetry would have never reached us. And yet the, the, the events, his forced Marantau gave him a whole different perspective. So I want to uh, maybe ask uh, 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 Gunawa and Mohammed to maybe uh, comment on this, uh, but also uh, maybe a, a quote you from an essay uh, mm -hmm. that you wrote on Al-Ghazali. And uh, Al-Ghazali has just left Baghdad and uh, he is attempting uh, to get away from political power, glorification of religious laws, you know, and even controversies on what it means to seek truth, right? Because uh, truth is, uh, is a complex thing when one actually encounters it, right? As we are discovering even in today's world. Um, and then there is this wonderful quote, and this is going to connect to what uh, Terry just said. He said, the Sufi in him understood that, and you quote him, that there is a mystery in spiritual reality which will remain unnavigable. In fact, so important did the unnavigable become that there can be found an oft-quoted sentence in his magnum opus. To disclose the mystery of God's power is the act of an unbeliever. Close quote. Can, can, you, can you talk a little bit about this and also maybe connect to what Idana and, and Terry were saying earlier? Well, uh... That's very heavy stuff, Al Ghazali. <laughs> uh, uh, hmm. Yeah, I think the beauty of, or the power of Sufism, is the recognition of the, the beyond, which is part of us at the same time. Hmm. Uh, it's very close to us, very far from us, for me. And, uh, that's why uh, Rumi is quoted by Terry. Uh, stays in a placeless, right? Is it placeless? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, geography doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. And but let me tell you something about. Uh, well, I'll compare it with what, what, the, uh, what the the Greek has. You know, the Greek has this myth of Odyssey, mm -hmm. and it's Odyssey is symbolized a metaphor for journey, travel. But I don't think it's a, tra a journey of Miranda, in a sense. Uh, I remember Emmanuel Lefinas, the Jewish French philosopher, who says that Odyssey, at the end, returns to his wife, Penelope, in his kingdom, Ithaca. And that's not a real journey. It's a the way back, always mm -hmm. a calling of the place, a calling of the sites. And, uh, and Lefinas, compared with Abraham, of course, the, the Jewish tradition is a wandering, wanderer, the wanderers is without having home. The, tra the tragedy of the world is this, now the Jews, decide to have home and kick the rest from the house's new home. Uh, but actually, it's, it's an old version of what John Lennon says, mm. imagine there's no country. Mm. It's the beauty of, I think, the, 
the, the, the wandering. And, and Idana mentioned about Mahabharata, Bhima Swarga in Bali. Uh, actually, in, in, in Bali and Java, there's another figure wandering. There are two. And it's not from Mahabharata, but from a folk story called Panji. Mm. Panji is wandering prince from the 12th century kingdom at Kideri and East Java. Somehow he went through the forest and then at the end, of course, a happy end, like Hollywood did, uh, meeting her, his, his princess. But the story of Panji is, of course, a story of wandering. That's, we call it Panji Kalana. Kalana means wandering. Mm. And it's, it's performing. Perform and, 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 and actually the story is very well, well spread. In, in Bali, they call it Mala. You can find it even in Kambuja. Uh, why this story can be, can, can, can find places in different areas, I don't know, but the story itself is, is, is a wandering, it's a wanderer. Uh, and that's one, one figure wandering in, 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 in Javanese tradition. There's another one. Uh, a book, a very famous book, called Tsundini. Tsundini is a very thick book, almost like an encyclopedia of Javanese customs and traditions. And a lot of many erotic stories, very naughty. But the, the beginning of the story is the beginning of two, the princess of a prince, I think one, yeah, one prince, uh, leaving the kingdom after, after unsolved by another, the bigger kingdom, Ataram. So he went to different parts of Java. At the end, he, he died at the sea. But the traveling is documented in a book called Tsundini. Uh, I read the book, it's very boring, but <laughs> uh, except, like, well, if you read it in, in song, it's wonderful, but if you read it just like that, it's very boring, but, uh, but except the erotic part, it's really wild, homosexuality and everything. And, you know, the, the transiting of border, homosexuality is acceptable, and at the same time, also, going to re religious ritual. So there was one scene, uh, one figure had a, a, a same sex event, and right away he goes to pray for the subu, for the morning prayer. It's, it's scandalous. And, but it, it's, it's part of something, and you can read it, uh, how, how Japanese, in some part of Japanese, Java, what kind of food, what kind of tradition, what kind of dance, it's all documented. Mm. Uh, it's more than Mahabharata, because Mahabharata is secure as a story of power. And, and it's, it's beautiful, but the Balinese make it more and more beautiful. But, uh, uh, but the story of wandering, I think, it's, is very much described in these two stories, mm. uh, Panji story and the Tsundiri story. Oh. Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to try and draw uh, Idana uh, into the conversation uh, since the words uh, uh, ethereal have been mentioned, uh, but also uh, wondering. Uh, uh, as a kind of a, uh, a way of, of, of thinking, but also something that is coded uh, into, into text, uh, but also as a knowledge system. Um, Idana, um, can, can you talk about another extraordinary kind of figure that you have written about, uh, which is uh, Dr. Jalantik? And uh, in, in, in your book, uh, perhaps you can begin with a little bit of background to who Dr. Jalantik was. Um, but in your book, you use this expression called the lightness of being. 
um, again, you know, a bit like the image of the eye. Uh, could you talk a little bit about this and, and, yeah. and the figure of Dr. Jalantik? Uh, so Dr. Jalantik, doc, Dr. Anakagung Made Jalantik. Anakagung means the son of prince and um, son of king, prince. And um, he, he was part, one of the sons of the Raja of Karankasim, which is this region east of Bali. And he was quite unusual son. Um, uh, he, uh, he uh, in many ways, um, also because this family, this royal families, there are, there are some royal families who were eight in Bali, eight kingdoms, who tended to uh, sort of support the Dutch. And, um, and this was one. But he actually was different. And um, uh, anyway, he had a shock when he was in Malang uh, one night as a, as a young man in high school. He was studying there because his landlady got very, very sick and um, and he he didn't know anything about health or nothing, and he he jumped on the bicycle and he went to look for a doctor desperately, and he didn't find one, so he she died that night, and he was next to her. So after this shock, he decided that he would become a doctor, a medical doctor, and he he was the first Balinese who managed to get to go off to Europe, to Amsterdam and study there. So um, this was, um, you know, the, the beginning of his adult life. And uh, this fact of being a, a healer, in fact, um, brought him to all sorts of places in the world. But um, it was a man, when I say lightness of being, actually, it, it, the, the, the term lightness of being was coined by a Czech, um, a Czech writer called Milan Kundera. And uh, it really um, uh, is contrary. <laughs> I use it because now uh, I, I kind of think of Dr. Jalantik as being this fresh, this lightness inside, you know. and. Uh, but the, the term, the right term, the, uh, refers to a person who is so superficial, so superficial that he actually uh, can, uh, is so light that he can actually lift up in the sky, you know, and uh, avoid suffering completely, you know, which is the contrary of Dr. Jalantik. Dr. Jalantik uh, carried his burdens uh, with, um, with a lightness, not because he didn't suffer, he suffered, but he was so deep and so wise. And also he was so curious that anything would wake up his, uh, um, his adolescent spirit, you know, so that life was always a discovery and, uh, and um, he was an extraordinary man, you know, um, who, uh, was also very, he had very, very um, such, um, you see, he, I just read this, he was deeply rooted to his Balinese culture and incorruptible in his principles. He faced many situations with enormous courage and was incapable of betraying his beliefs and values. Thanks to his humor, uh, irony, self-effacement, and the ability, and this is important in life, the ability to put authorities in their place without letting them feel his superiority. He was able to survive the many challenges of his life and countless life-threatening situations. Um, uh, now, this life-threatening situations and the he always said that he, he was blessed by uh, um, 
a birthmark um, which was uh, observed by what we discovered later was uh, the poet Tagore who was visiting his father in 1927 and he saw this little child and he said to the father, he said, you don't, this is your son, you don't have to worry about him ever because he has this birthmark and he will be, uh, he will go through many dangers in life, but he will always survive. And if you actually saw this birthmark, you can't even believe how Tagore noticed it because it's a tiny little dot in the middle of his neck, you know. But, um, you know, this is one side. Uh, he always said, this is my birthmark. So lightness of being, yes, lightness of being as applied to Dr. Gelantic is very different from the Milan Kundera <laughs> lightness of being. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe I can ask uh, uh, Gunawan um, about uh, a piece that he wrote, uh, uh, which is uh, experience. It's a very early piece. I think it's from the, from the 1980s, I believe, early 1980s. Uh, titled a solar eclipse over Borobudo mm. and um, in a way it's it's sort of connecting to all these fantastic trajectories no of a kind of a mystical universalism but also realizing uh, that one is merely a small part of a much much larger kind of cosmology right uh, in this world and also in a much larger kind of uh, imagination um, so uh, uh, Gunawan, can you can you can you talk a little bit about this uh, in terms of the kinds of meditations that happen uh, in your own work in relation to time? Uh, because uh, you're standing in Brobudo and you have this kind of cosmological <laughs> experience, and you realize, and it, it sort of ends in this kind of very interesting way. It says that, uh, and let me quote you here. He says. Uh, we creatures who are invisible from endless outer space, we inhabitants beneath an ancient temple that when measured in astronomical time is still in its infancy, only four eclipses old. We are merely dust. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, it's uh, the vanity of the human being to think that he or she is the center of the universe. Uh, and that's, that's what the Borobudur, well, I, when you are when you are in, in, this, in this total eclipse, it takes place for every four hundred years. You see the the, the magnitude of time there. You you can sense that uh, the immortality of time, same time, the the limit of your being, and uh, let me. Go back to, to Idana's uh, mention about lightness being. Actually, Milan Kunera make, makes very uh, uh, interpret this kind of as, as, uh, yeah demeaning about the, the idea of lightness. But Nietzsche celebrates lightness and ridicules the spirit of heavy. You know, religious religious fanaticism is heavy. Bigotry is heavy, uh, all big things, but being light. That's why Nietzsche said, I, 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 I want to, I can only worship, I, I, I quote it from memory, God who dances. Because dancing is a sign of lightness, creativity, and unpredictability, and the endlessness of it. The dance never ends. Actually, even when it stops, it's just a, an interruption. Uh, I think that's why. This, I think what that's what I feel when I was in Borobudur in this total eclipse, realizing that it's all, it happens in once in four hundred years, and what I am <laughs> in this period of time, nothing, just nothing. Uh, yeah. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Uh, 
Uh, Terry, uh, let me ask you uh, another broader question before we bring it back to your own writings, because I realize that we haven't actually talked about your your writing, but we'll come to that. Uh, we'll save mm. we'll save some of the good stuff for the last. But um, uh, I want to uh, sort of get you talking about mm. the Asian tradition still, mm. staying with it. Mm. Um, especially in relation to Buddhist monks, you know, the Darvish or even the sannyasi. Mm. Mm. Um, and how the word wandering is also connected to the phrase exile. Mm. Mm. Right? Yeah. Can, you, can you talk a little bit more about this? Well, perhaps uh, Lord Buddha is the, is the absolute iconic figure. Exile from what? He leaves everything that modern man is seeking. Wealth, position, beautiful home, comfortable life, all that we enclose ourselves with uh, that we're told in this epoch is the, is, the, uh, is the pinnacle of success, he leaves. And where does he go? Well, essentially he goes into exile. He ultimately leaves his kingdom he wanders and as an ascetic in his wandering confronting suffering and as as uh, as ganawan was saying also confronting this 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 uh, uh, infinitesimal moment where we're here on the earth he begins his meditation finally in bodhgaya under the uh, famous uh, same famous bodhi tree but in that tradition, then you have a whole series of ascetic uh, figures that appear in the Asian tradition. Milarepa, the famous Tibetan uh, wanderer who leaves his 100,000 songs. You have the Upanishads, uh, has the ascetic uh, Paramahamsa, who's referred to as the Supreme Swan, an entire Upanishad dedicated to the ascetic wanderer. You have, as we said, Rumi, or as they called him, Maulana, the great, uh, the great, uh, the great teacher, uh, who uh, begins in Bach, ends in Konya. Um, in a way, also the Wali Songo, who who, who arrive in Indonesia, uh, the mystics who arrive and 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 bring Islam to Indonesia, they had wandered across the oceans. Um, in fact, if you go a step further, then you see in Idana's story. Uh, this, these two Balinese figures, Twalan and Merda, these, uh, 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 they, they, they represent, shall we say, the common man. Where do they wander? Off into the afterlife. So uh, they follow Bhima, yes, into the afterlife. That's how the story of Bhima Swarga begins. But all of this is part of an ongoing tradition. You could argue, perhaps in the, in the, in the West, St. Francis, uh, almost embodies the life of the Buddha in his way. Uh, but this is a very strong, deep tradition, and, and the wandering is all part of that exploration. Hmm. Um, I want to maybe recall one anecdote uh, before hmm. we turn to the Western canon. Hmm. And uh, for that, we'll need Idana to narrate this story, because... Uh, Something happens to Dr. Jalantik um, in his 80s. Uh, he falls ill and enters a coma. Uh, Idana, can you tell us what happens? Because he, he, he also wanders and he travels somewhere and returns. Well, in his 80s, um, again with his uh, uh, really altruistic uh, nature, and, and uh, Gunawan knew even better probably than myself, Dr. Jalantik. <laughs> um, he, he suddenly finds out that in the hospital, Sangla Hospital in Denpasar, there was this um, Dutch doctor who had arrived with a new method of um, uh, operating hernia. So he gives himself uh this operation he did you know he needed an area operation but it wasn't that urgent 
and he said, why don't you try it on me? And um, so he was part of a, uh, he said he was surrounded by all these young doctors learning this new operation. So it was a lesson, you know. And the operation was successful, but then um, I don't know what happened. There was an infection and uh, he was uh, between life and death. And then he fell into coma. He came to Surabaya and he was gone for a long, well, he, he was gone. We thought we would never see him again. And he was in coma deep coma for about 35 days. Meanwhile, all sorts of uh, things happened, um, uh, especially his daughter. There was, um, there was a festival of shamans in, uh, in, um, in Tirtaganga, in East Bali, and they were all praying for him. <laughs> there was the whole prayer, the temple for him, and he woke up at the moment, the day before, the doctors in Surabaya, or two days before, called all the family to reunite because it, it, they thought the end had come. And instead he woke up and he saw his family around. He said, what are you doing all here? <laughs> and, That's an amazing uh, story. <laughs> what are you doing all here? Am I, am I dying? And they were so astonished because his mind worked perfectly. And uh, what, what didn't work was all his right side. And um, he was like, um, so anyway, he was well enough to be taken back home. And at home, he, uh, he started to really want to use this arm and try to bring it back. And so the best thing was to start painting again. I think the last time he painted was actually during his honeymoon in, um, in, uh, in Holland. He married a Dutch um, wonderful girl and uh, he, uh, he was in this honeymoon and, and he painted you know, the nature around them on this island. And it was, Oh my God, it was something like 65 years before, you know. So he had never, he loved painting. He actually uh, was an artist because he played the violin quite, quite well. And also he, he, he could paint like, like the majority of Balinese can paint actually, you know, they're, they're not afraid of it. And uh, uh, so um, he, uh, he started, automatically to make scenes from his memory of moments of danger in his life, the danger that he had survived. And um, when I went to see him, he had made three of these paintings. And I was so astonished by what I saw and, um, and I said, Dr. Gelanti, go on, please go on and just remember anything, you know, that is, stands out in your mind and, and, uh, and give us that scene. And so when I went back a few months later, he had painted 43 scenes and they were quite large in watercolor, which is difficult to make large watercolors, but they were beautifully made. And so he started to describe me all this. Actually, at the beginning, I said, look, if you, if you paint all the scenes of your life, the, the most uh, effective one, the most dangerous one, the, most, the ones that are in your mind, you know, then we can make a book. So um, there they were. So what I did, I asked him to borrow all these paintings and I brought, I brought them back home. At the time I lived in the hills, um, East Bali, and we had a long corridor, open corridor, and I put one, one uh, next to the other. And then I called my friends in the village, um, 
it was, you know, it, it's still quite a, a remote area, you know. I called uh, the people in the village because I wanted to see whether they could read the narrative without knowing the story. I was very interested in this um, because the, the Balinese actually have that way they can understand symbols and we in the West uh, cannot anymore. I mean, in my city, everything is symbol um, on, the, on the walls of the churches and, and nobody knows what it means, you know. Um, and they are not taught that, but the Balinese have this because their, wor their whole world has to do also with rituals and symbols. And so, and they, and they could read them, not all of them, but some of them, they just said, oh, this is what's happening here and here, you know, and they could tell me the story. So, um, so then I, I did the book with Dr. Jelantic, you know, and it was, Fascinating. Yeah, this one I thought was beautiful. <laughs> yes. Um, maybe I can um, ask uh, Terry the to. The book. The book was a big coffee table book, which nobody reads. So now I'm so happy that we managed with Eric Wee and Perry Plus to make. Uh, this wonderful book that is a readable book and the, it, the reproductions are beautiful and it's called The World Odyssey of a Balinese Prince. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking, Idana, uh, to sort of pick up on uh, what uh, you mentioned about symbols and uh, perhaps to, to, to get uh, Terry and Gunawan uh, to comment on this. Perhaps we can ask Terry uh, to start. Uh, because Terry, I mean, you've you re also written extensively on uh, the question of Islam. And uh, often uh, you have also highlighted in your writings uh, the work of uh, Sufi mystics. You know, uh, Ibn Arabi, for instance, um, who in a way uh, is from, well, uh, what is today, the Iberian Peninsula, but Andalusia, and mm. uh, ends his journey in Damascus. Mm. You know? uh, can, you, can you talk about uh, the use of symbols uh, with regards to this? I mean, there's also, you've also cited, for instance, in Searching for Hassan, you know, the, mm. the, 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 the epic poem, right? Conference of the Birds yes. uh, by yes. Fariduddin Attar. Uh, yes. can, can you talk a little bit more about this uh, as a way to bridge? Well, what's, I mean, the, the beauty with that, that poetry is um, that symbols are used continually. So why the birds? Why does Atar use this? It's actually in Arabic, uh, the, the, the word is closer to dialogue, the dialogue with the birds, the conversation of the birds, uh, instead of a conference. What, th the reason the birds are chosen is because for someone who is searching in this storytelling mode, uh, someone who's searching out as spiritual, they're not grounded on earth. They're not firmly set in their daily life, plunging away and pounding away, but rather uh, the use of the birds was a way of describing those who were seeking and searching. Uh, closer to the heavens, flying, uh, with this ability of flight, being able to transverse, uh, say, large areas, frontiers. And so when Atar uses that as a symbol, he's actually speaking to those uh, or, or offering those who, are, who, who understand the language a way of describing themselves. Um, Ibn Arabi is an extraordinary character because he travels from Andalusia and ends up dying in Damascus. He travels across all of North Africa, uh, from, from Tunis to Cairo, of course. And, uh, and he, again, back to what Gunawan was saying, and you were mentioning this kind of universal mysticism, uh, part of what 
the wonder experiences is this is this liberation uh, I give you this um, example that Ibn Arabi, this poem that he writes, that kind of sums it up. Uh, he writes here, O oh wonder, a garden amidst the flames. My heart has become capable of every form. It is a pasture for gazelles, a monastery for Christian monks, and a temple for idols, and the pilgrim's Kaaba and the tablets of the Torah, and the book of the Quran. I follow the religion of love. Whatever way love's camels take, that is my religion and my faith. And with these beautiful metaphors, he's able also to offer anyone who is listening that liberating view of as, as Gnawan was saying, the lightness of leaving those heavy prejudices, judgments, thoughts, every, uh, say, uh, um, uh, religiously bound uh, prescriptions, leave that all aside. And you notice he uses the word, whatever way loves camels take me. In other words, he's not even he's not even in charge of his his path. That will be decided. Uh, that that look that Gunawan was describing, or uh, that even uh, Latif was mentioning, these three people sitting on that bench that seized him. His humanity reached out. He could feel their their loss between a traditional world and now these skyscrapers. What does their life mean? In fact, the train doesn't even stop at that station. What does that mean? How do they find meaning in that? Uh, and Gunawan's reference to noticing the kindness, noticing the smiles that people trade. I mean, this is the spirit that comes out of Sufism. This is the great evol evolution, the great elevation that occurs in the, in the 13th, 14th century that really allows a new interpretation of this uh, faith to spread everywhere. And I would argue also, I think many would say that it's only that kind of interpretation that would have allowed it to uh, enter into uh, 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 Southeast Asia, because a more rigid doctrinal uh, philosophy wouldn't have wouldn't have um, wouldn't have found roots, and, uh, and and so these 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 metaphors are 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 both powerful, but they're also liberating. And we come back to this question of lightness, and the wanderer can come back with that. He doesn't come back with horror stories. The wanderer comes back with that those those kind of those kind of tales that thread and 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 reconfirm this family of man. Hmm. Do you want to add anything to what Terry said? Because I have a I have a follow up question on on Don Quixote or should I call him Don Quixote? But uh, we, we we come to we come to that. Uh, but any anything you want to add to what Terence just said? Uh, me. Yes. Yeah, it's wonderful what Terry said about the Arabian, his camels of love. Well, because it's beautiful. Uh, that's, that, that brings me to, to symbol. The problem with symbol is that it can trap you into in the more important entity than, than your feeling. And it's fixed you in a, in a meaning, in a fixed meaning, while metaphors are more fluid, and that's why, uh, that's why maybe that's why the the Quran and the and the Bible use metaphors more and symbols. It's more poorly interpretable. There's no one meaning of one thing, but then symbol can be just one meaning. Like we have. A star spangled banner is one meaning symbol, but metaphor it, 
can bring you anywhere, like the camel mentioned by Ibn Arabi. Uh, this is the sad thing about religion. It transformed metaphor into symbol. Just like the, the Saudi transformed Mecca into uh, Las Vegas. Uh, you know, could, could edify everything, uh, making everything stand still, magnificent, big, heavy. And, you know, of course, you, you read Ali Sariati's travel to, to the Hajj. So the fluidity is there, the magic of fluidity, but no more when you make even your religion an idol. Uh, even your idea of God, an idol, which is a symbol. Uh, there's a, a French theologian who said that the danger of uh, uh, idolatry of concept your God is defined into a symbol, and then you worship. It never, there's no fluid in the meaning of God. And love is replaced by power. And religion is replaced by architecture. Uh, that's what I like to I mean, in a way, it's also a, a kind of a re reading of, of modernism, right? That you yes. Offer. Um, and it's 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 a kind of a condition, I suppose, uh, that artists, writers, poets have engaged with uh, across the twentieth century, uh, in in their own critical ways. And I, I I want to kind of maybe turn your attention uh, to uh, a modernist text, in a sense, right? Uh, uh, a text that you have meditated upon. Uh, over a number of years, uh, which is, of course, the classic uh, Don Quixote. And um, I want to maybe um, uh, ask you to potentially uh, comment uh, what has fascinated you about the text uh, over all these years. And uh, as a, maybe a second part, um, uh, uh, you recently described to me that Don Quixote became Don Quixote um, and then traveled to the Spice Islands. And I, I want to hear more about, about what happened uh, with that, right? So the, the Javanese brother of, of Don Quixote. And, 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 and yeah, please. Yeah, what, is, what interests me about the novel is that it doesn't have a real author or pretends not to have an author. So you cannot tell Cervantes pull your leg. Uh, he claims he doesn't write, write it. It's, it's not his story, but somebody else's story. It's Don Quixote's sound story. And then at the end of the book, you meet this Said Bank, Said Hamid bin Yanjali, an Arab, whom Don Cervantes uh, said, this is the author, and, and that's very interesting because there's no authority. Uh, the authority is no longer there. It's, it's up, up, up to you, up, up the readers, and up to the characters. And the, the other thing is, you know, that Cervantes fought in the battle of Lapento against the Turks, and he was wounded. And it was, uh, uh, he was jailed, or become a, a what is it, Sandra, or just, and, and uh, you, uh, yeah, in and, and, and that area of, of the North Africa, uh, people get, like in Somalia, kidnapped, and then you have to, to pay to get free. And he spent there, four years, watching tortures, everything. And it's in the context of Muslim and Christian uh, battle, represented by the Turks and the Ottomans and the Spanish, the, 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 the European powers. Um, but when Cervantes wrote the, the book, you hardly discern the bitterness 
of old and, and mighty. Because maybe because it's the, the humor, and humor makes everything light and approachable. And maybe because he saw many things which he didn't see in, in Madrid. You know, Madrid was not a cosmopolitan city then, but Algiers, where he was put into jail, was a cosmopolitan city. Who run this, the place was a, an Italian actually, converted into Islam and ruled the, the, the area. Uh, so he, he was more, you know, if an, the second book was written after King Philip's uh, threw away Muslims and Jews out of Spain, and the first major ethnic cleansing in history. And Cervantes transcends that. Then, then, then you have this, this idea of uh, traveling, crossing borders, crossing the high literature and low literature, trans transversing that, and admitting influences from different parts. And, you know, uh, one, in one chapter, uh, Don Quixote tells some Chupasa that, you know, you know everything we alone will owe the lot to the Arabs, the words they have. Uh, that's, that's very easy to me, in writing without preaching. And Don Quixote is, was stupid, according to some people, but Maybe that's the way to ridicule the high and the mighty. Uh, that's my reading. And I think it's a sad story in a way, because uh, he loves Dulcinea that never exists. He, so imagination and love and passion and futility shaped him. Uh, Yes, I, I can't tell you more, but uh, let me go back to, to, to answer your question about, about Don Quixote in eastern part of Indonesia. Yeah, uh, we, the, the novels were, were, were translated into Indonesian two years ago. Uh, so it's a historic moment for Indonesian literature. So there was a celebration to launch it. And the Hervantes Foundation in Indonesia worked with me in Salihara to celebrate it. And we created the puppet, like the Wayang Golek in, in West Java, but the characters are from the story. And the, the curious thing, the person, the artist who crept, carved the vases, Never, never read the novel. Never met any Spaniards. Maybe he just saw pictures, and it was wonderful. He was a, just farmer, and when it was and was performed in, in Jakarta, and then because this year I think was the fourth hundred years of Mag Magellan visiting the Malukus. So the Maluku people wanted to celebrate it and we invited us to go there. And another experience because you saw a different kind of Muslim in, in, in Maluku. It's not like the one in, in well maybe in the old in Indonesia it was more like that than, than the new, the contemporary Indonesia which a lot of Wahhabi is coming in. Uh, this and this beautiful place is the part of it. You should go there. The sea is incredible. Okay, did I?
Sarto. Saya Om Den. Ya. Namamu Sancho bukan Saya Oh Sancho Pancasila Kalau tak salah Om Nama saya cuma Sancho Pansa Cuma Pansa Oh Pakai S Bukan C ah, C Saya tak suka pakai S Puru suka marwahe Maksudku huruf E Oh maaf om Saya tak tahu Saya kan buta huruf Oh kamu buta huruf Tapi Bisa naik kuda kan Tak bisa om Tapi cuma bisa naik keledai saya Oh punya keledai Punya om Warisan dari saya pe papa Dulu saya Ya um, Idana I'm thinking uh, maybe we can uh, sort of evoke uh, another figure uh, that has fascinated, I would say, both you and Terence uh, over the years. Um, that is uh, the story of a Dutch cyclist uh, who also uh, decides to visit Bali for various reasons. Uh, but he is also a wanderer in a way because he witnesses horrors, you know, uh, but also arrives on the island not again with the intention of changing its in inhabitants, but learning from them. You know? That's W. O. Even come. Um, can I ask you to talk a little bit about him uh, before we turn to to Terry as well? Well, first of all, I think that Nievenkamp, W.O.J. Nievenkamp, I don't think he would like to be remembered as a cyclist. <laughs> he was a great artist. He was an anthropologist, ethnologist, journalist. Um, he was a man of all seasons, you know. And uh, um, um, he's... <laughs> the fact... You see, he uh, he was a Dutchman who did not believe uh, the news and the status quo that was presented about Indonesia to the Dutch people by the Dutch. So he insisted to go to Indonesia and see with his own eyes uh, because uh, the Indonesians from all parts of the archipelago were presented as savages, primitive, and um, he uh, he had the luck. He became he came from a quite wealthy family, and so he could afford to be a wanderer in uh, in the um, late well eighteen hundred uh, late almost nine turn of the century, let's say. Um, and he went to Indonesia and he, uh, he went there before 1900, uh, but he stopped in Java. And then suddenly he decided that he had to go to Bali. And uh, Bali was the last island in the entire archipelago where the Dutch actually uh, landed. Uh, because the seas were very, very difficult and the whole geographical thing about mountains dividing the, the island, the southern Bali, I would say. And so um, he went to the, uh, the Dutch um, representative in Batavia and, his, and he asked permission to go to Bali. And, and uh, reluctantly, um, he was given permission to board uh, he was told that there was a first uh, attempt to land in southern Bali and there was a first military ship that was going to leave and he could be on the ship. But he should not, uh, once 
once they arrived in Bali, in southern Bali, he should not step step foot on land, um, which was a rather awkward thing to say. But anyway, so he had a bicycle. He had brought a bicycle. Um, I think he found a bicycle in Batavia because the Dutch bicycle is was already famous, you know, and he brought a bicycle on the military ship. And so um, he actually witnessed uh, the arrival of the Dutch army into Denpasar, what is now called Denpasar, and he, he witnessed the Puputan, which is the um, fight to the end, means fight to the end of the whole court of the Raja of Badung uh, that came out from the palace to, uh, to meet the Dutch army. And they, it was a mass suicide. Um, uh, um, now he witnessed that and he was the man who took the photographs actually of all the, the, the dead uh, uh, on the Padang in, on the big lawn and uh, in Denpasar, in Badung, and um, they were all dressed in white. So it, it's an amazing picture, actually. Anyway, then um, he painted and drawn uh, many drawings about the destroyed palace. Uh, the Dutch had put fire to the palace and, and to some parts of the town. And, uh, and then he decided, which is an incredible courage he must have had, uh, to take his bicycle and go around Bali. Now, uh, <laughs> the rumors of the Dutch arrival and the, the, the put Puputan must have, everybody in Bali knew by then, you know, but he had courage because, and also the, the Balinese, uh, any white man they saw, they, they identified him with a Dutch. They were not used to seeing French and the English, and so it was a Dutchman. And he, um, he decided to go around Bali, and uh, it's very uh, fantastic, the fact of, um, the fact that he was an artist uh, completely saved him because he, he was drawing all the time. He would arrive in a village with his bicycle, he would put, and then he would pull out his, uh, his uh, uh, you know, either, either um, and I don't know how to say it in English, but anyway, his tools to draw and paint. And he would be surrounded by villagers who knew very well that he was Dutch, but they wouldn't touch him. They would respect it because he used something they could identify with. I grew up in Florence and uh, I ended up in Bali um, early on and in, in, in Southeast Asia also, I mean in other parts. But um, uh, I, I saw uh, in North Bali while I was traveling and searching for Kirtagosa, the meaning of Kirtagosa. I bumped into this um, uh, carving, stone carving in North Bali at a temple that represented a man on a bicycle. And so I asked who it was and nobody knew. They said, oh, a, a Dutch perhaps, but they said, you know, they always point to Java, you know, to Java. And, uh, and then um, I saw a photograph uh, because Hans Hofer, who did the photographs of Kirtagosa, had photographed the carving. And also, I think, in other times. And he didn't know who it was. Nobody knew. So uh, it was very interesting, this carving, because it was a man with a, <laughs> the, the, the wheels were made of lotus, like, like two flowers. Um, and um, it was obviously a foreigner. So then I do my book, The Epic of Life, and I send a copy to my father. I'm very proud of this book, <laughs> and I send a copy to my father. Then I arrive in Florence, and my father says, uh, one of the tenants of my father was 
a man who was quite well known of an, um, a dealer of, of precious, rare books. And so he, he said, you know, I gave the book to him, I lent it to him, and he said he wants to speak with you when you arrive. So I went to speak to this man and he said, Betidana, you know that in Fiesole, which is the hill overlooking Florence, there is an incredible collection of Balinese and Javanese and Indonesian art. And I said, really? And I said, look, um, this was a Dutchman and the daughter is still alive and she married an Italian. And so I, I asked the name and I said, oh, but I know Bramanti. I know, I used to play with them, with her children when I was a child in this place, in this villa. And uh, he said, well, why don't you call and bring this book to her and show her because I think she'll be delighted. She's very old. So I called, I go there and uh, I, with the book <laughs> under my arm and Terry was with me and the, this gate, you know, opens, and then I go and I see on the wall the tile, tile with the man of the bicycle in Bali, with the, the same, the same um, in in a, in a in a terracotta tile, and. So Where did you get this tile? I see this incredible collection of art and books. Mm -hmm. and, and they say, oh, that's my yeah. grandfather. That's my grandfather. So I discover in Florence who the person in Bali on the stone carving was. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, the whole adventure with Nievenkamp begins. Okay. Uh, thanks, Idana. So I'm going to maybe move into the last kind of section of our conversation today, uh, which is sort of really thinking about um, potential futures and how, in a way, uh, uh, our thinking can intersect with it, uh, but also looking at it from the point of view of movement, right, and writing uh, through that space of movement. So I'm going to turn to Terry first and maybe return uh, to his provocation um, with which we began uh, this conversation. And uh, Terry, you said that in a way, uh, wanderers form part of a global view mm -hmm. um, that rests in tension with mercantile networks. And I, I, I want you to talk a little bit more about this mm -hmm. and uh, what, 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 where you were coming from uh, as well. Well, in the in Singapore's uh, Museum of Asian Civilizations, there's a shipwreck, and it's a very important symbol, I think, for in Singapore to show how the country wants to embrace these these long networks. A network that in those days, that shipwreck represents a voyage from Basra, Iraq, and it was on its way perhaps to China and sunk off the coast. And in that shipwreck is a mapping that goes beyond borders, a mapping that goes, an identity that goes beyond a nation state. In fact, it's a way of a metaphor for the nation state to offer the idea that it, it sees itself as part of a larger network, part of a globalized world. And I think it serves its purpose very well. However, merchants, as we know, tend to protect their sources. And this is where I was talking about, if it's just a mercantile relationship, what does that mean? Merchants protect their sources. The only real uh, uh, major work that arrives in the West from any merchant was Marco Polo's, uh, what they called Il Milione. Now, Marco Polo only had that book written, not because he put his pen to paper, 
but because like Cervantes, he was in prison for three years. <laughs> and the man who was in the cell next to him heard him tell these stories over and over and over again, as merchants love to boast. And it is Ranuccello who, who, who writes these stories down. So merchants typically protect their sources. They keep secrets. They never share details. The last thing they want is to allow the competition to go to the same source, offer a cheaper price, and then take away their goods. So there's also no culture building. Yes, shoes, uh, luxury items, spices are traded back and forth. But it's the storytellers who operate with a completely different uh, 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 method. These wanderers who actually are outside of the mercantile realm, who go to those far corners of the world and come back. And when they come back, they, their reporting or their storytelling is a form of culture making. It allows somebody from... For instance, when Idana was there looking at this ceiling paintings in, in Bali, well, there's another way of describing it. You could say it's the Balinese divine comedy. Or you could say that, you know, Dante used the same references. Now, what does that mean? Do we have something in our genetic DNA that wants to ask this question? What is that journey beyond like? What will we discover? I mean, the Florentines are only interested in looking at inferno, hell, the journey into hell. They could care less about Paradiso because they know that everybody that's, uh, that's um, uh, you know, interesting characters, they're all down there. But the, the, so the storyteller not only comes back and helps to, cre say, create these bridges of this family of man, but also uh, helps to, in the case of somebody like a nerving camp, present a completely different picture. And I say that because it is only because of merchants, and we have to pay attention, it's only because of merchants that colonial empires were established. The first empires were not national countries going out and conquering. It was a few Dutch businessmen who got a, a, a series of a flotilla of, of, of boats together and then went out and started their adventure in Southeast Asia along the Indonesian archipelago. It had no, nothing to do with the national destiny. Similarly with the British, it was the British East Indies Company that did this. So merchants, and what happened in Latin America as well. The merchants have this, have this idea of finding the source, taking it, protecting it. If need be, we'll hire mercenaries. We will guard it. We can have that monopoly, the Spice Islands that, that, uh, that uh, uh, Gunawan was talking about was the source, yes, of Magellan's voyage, also the source of Christopher Columbus' voyage. What ended up happening after Magellan's voyage is all of the, the Philippines becomes uh, a Spanish colony. So, again, how does this wander, how does the storyteller and how does art help us to break free from that uh, madness, from that uh, sort of avarice uh, that drives, like Mohammed was saying, that those darker impulses and it's, it's this lightness. It's this ability to come back with a different narrative. Uh, somebody like W.O.J. was actually an activist. He was trying to tell his people, listen, you think you have a sophisticated culture? Wait until you see what I can show you. This is a very different reality. You've all been lied to. And that was a profound... Uh, a profound moment for him because he found himself again cast into exile. He couldn't stand to live in Holland because his message was so against the merchant empire uh, and the colonial view that had been established to ensure that merchant empire. So, so in a way, we 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 look at Latif. Let's come back to him. What does he do in his Marantau? He goes across Southeast Asia. 
Does he see frontiers and borders? No, he sees nature. He views nature and he views the, 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 the natural life around him. He sees the farmer, the kerbao, the, 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 uh, the, the bull uh, becomes a metaphor uh, in his work, as does the bamboo shoot, as does the, the pagoda, uh, where he gets the name Pago Pago, a derivative. And in that view, he creates a whole different vision of a region, a region all united, not divided by nation states, a region that shares all these commonalities. And he calls it Tropica with a lovely K, hmm? with a Tropica. As if to say, if we could think like this, perhaps we can release ourselves from aggressions, from all the violence that comes out when nation states are competing back and forth. And I think it's the artist that can help to plant those seeds. Uh, Ganawan in his work is always uh, planting these seeds to help uh, readers see beyond their fixed point, just standing there, but to really uh, appreciate what is far across the ocean, but then he returns it home to their, to their heart, to their world. And that, I think, is the, uh, the work of the artist. And uh, if we leave it just to the mercantile mind, there's always uh, there, there's, there's a lot of sadness that's embedded in that as well. So how do we, how do we sort of grasp with the two? And at the Singapore National Gallery, your, your, all your work is trying to weave that other narrative through your visual paintings, through or embracing all of the different countries that have uh, uh, offered their works. And yet one can see that common thread mm. in a way that uh, Latif anticipated in the 60s. So reforming the narrative and uh, uh, helps to reduce all these uh, tensions that are used by politicians continually. Fear, insecurity, we see it happening with this lunatic in the White House now, you know, America first. What do you mean America first? It's a whole globe. Uh, you know, you can't, that, that kind of idiocy uh, uh, threatens us. It doesn't enhance anything. So, so I think that, uh, that's what I meant by culture making. And that's why, what I meant by the, the journeyer coming back with the stories, you know, weaving those threads. Fantastic. Um, for now, one uh, last question, perhaps, and maybe even uh, uh, sort of closing remarks. Um, uh, is 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 uh, Terry's uh, provocation um, of developing a alternative kind of narrative to neoliberalism, uh, which you have commented on? Uh, in, in, in numerous writings over the years. Uh, is this the wondrous task? Uh, it's part of a wondrous task, but it's not, not only the wonder. But, uh, I think the, the risk of having nation states is always building borders walls and paranoia and, 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 and hatred. It's not only nation states, but religion too. So traveling is traversing, transcending borders and bringing, like Teddy said, going back, but not as the same person because every time you go and return, you change. You change with the other inside you. And the problem, of course, that people never like that forever. Always try to rebuild this institutions, walls, and building, you know. Uh, the problem with the religions, they start building 
faith as a fortress, not as a torch, light to fly to in the darkness when you travel by insisting on the traveling. But when you create a faith as a fortress, you close down, you close yourself. Uh, nation states like that. Of course, nation states are very important because otherwise, how would you handle this pandemic, world pandemic? And the, the curious thing about the pandemic is, in one way, is inter internationalized events, suffering, fear. On the other hand, it closed you to your locked in situation to prevent people from coming and outgoing. And if we are not aware of this, the paradox of the pandemic, we can go back to the old uh, divisions and suspicions. Just like if, if somebody else coming from other countries is contagious and that's it's going to to end the world. And maybe that's why Donald Trump is, is a danger in this world. Wow. I give a very, very a predictable sermon. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Um, any, any other last remarks um, that any of the speakers want to make? before we wrap up. Well, uh, I'd like to thank Terry and Dana. Uh, Dana's story about this Dutch painter, I think his works are now being collected in Indonesia, published, no, the, the documents, the old works. And it's a wonderful story. And I, I never knew about it. So I learned for the first time today. And of course, I enjoy Terry's explanation about things. Uh, but yeah, I like to share this Ibn Arabi's passion. He's my hero. Uh, Idana, any, any last remarks? And then we'll give the last word to Terry before we close for the day. Uh, Gunawan, what you said about Odysseus is really so interesting because I always had the feeling that he was not transformed, uh, that he went back to Ithaca. So, as you said, all throughout, he has this security of this home and this wife you know, waiting for him, perhaps not, but perhaps yes. And uh, uh, you don't have the feeling in the entire Odyssea that, uh, that he, he, he went through a transformation. So he's less of a wanderer of anyone that was mentioned. <laughs> and also he didn't produce any poetry, any, there's, there's you know, other than Odyssea, or Odyssea, the Odysseus, the, 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 the idea of this incredible epic journey, you know. Um, there, is, um, there is a quote that I want to read, and I have no idea. I perhaps wrote it, but I don't remember writing it. Um, but um, apparently I have, I don't remember. But it was in, in, uh, in connection to Nervenkamp, actually, and it can be applied in general. And it is, in times of calamity and natural disasters, wars, disease, and uncertainty, it is so hopeful to find human beings who follow a universal path of life, not afraid of moving from one culture to the other, whether they are fixed in a place or actually go out. You know, this is the way I see the wanderer. 
Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, Terry. Yeah, I would just uh, echo what uh, both uh, Idan and uh, Gnawan have said. Um, Odysseus does not come back transformed. <laughs> In fact, there is a whole other interpretation of why the voyage took 10 years. And it is precisely because it is his clever mind that developed the idea of the Trojan horse and all those, uh, the tragedy of the slaughter of Troy took place. And in a way, those 10 years were punishment by the gods who were so furious that a whole city was put to the sword by the Greeks. So, so in a way it could be seen as a punishment until he finally returns home. But of course, there are a few gods that help him along the way. So uh, that's how he navigates. But, uh, but what's funny is that uh, I, I had two thoughts in mind. James Joyce, so what are we, two and a half millennium later, James Joyce, an Irishman in exile, in Trieste, writes uh, Ulysses, and what does he use? He doesn't use a great warrior. He uses the wandering Jew, Leopold Bloom, as his metaphor. And Leopold Bloom does what? He walks through the streets of Dublin on Bloomsday, uh, what's now known as Bloomsday, that's celebrated in one day. And what Joyce was trying to say, he, he, he often uh, made this comment, why do you always write about Dublin? He says, I write about Dublin because if I can capture Dublin in all her extremes, in all her dimensions, I'm writing about every city in the world. And then he also said that good stories, storytelling and good stories that remain, move from the mundane to the mythic and from the provincial, think of Dublin here, to the universal. And and in a way, he was capturing this, this, this notion of being in the fixed place, but then also being able to extrapolate. So, so I'll finish with this, um, yeah, this uh, piece I wrote at the end of uh, my book on this uh, journey, uh, because I think to emphasize what we were all saying is it's the, it's the journey that transforms uh, the person. Uh, perhaps the merchants don't get as transformed as we'd like them to be. Um, but I wrote here, enlightening journeys have long served as portals for self-discovery and meaning. For us, our search for Hassan, which was our last great voyage together as a family, it changed us utterly. Like the birds of Attar, our path to find our long lost friend brought us face to face with love beyond all politics and preconceived judgments, beyond earth and sky, beyond death and rebirth, beyond all opposites, when we first descended from that plane in Shiraz to step on the high plateau of Fars or Iran, little did we know that Rumi had already mapped out centuries before our final destination. He wrote, out beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and right doing. There is a field. I'll meet you there. I want to thank you, uh, Mustafa and Ganawan, Idana, and uh, your whole team at the Singapore National Gallery for this for this chance uh, to to weave ideas together, and uh, hope we can meet soon. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Um, thank you to all of you on behalf of uh, my colleagues, of course. And uh, thank you to everyone who's, who's joined us uh, today evening. I know we're moving across multiple time zones uh, and, uh, and uh, in a way also some difficult times, especially with COVID-19. So uh, I really hope everybody uh, keeps safe. And uh, if you do have 
uh, comments uh, and questions, uh, please do post them in the chat function uh, at the bottom. And uh, uh, all three writers uh, will be happy to respond to them uh, in, in, in good time. Uh, so once again, thank you to the speakers, uh, fellow wanderers, and uh, thank you to everybody who's joined us. And we hope you will, uh, you will, you will, you will also log in uh, for the rest of the sessions because we have some fantastic stuff coming up. Uh, tomorrow we'll talk to uh, Alan Antliff, uh, the art historian who will break down Latif Mohidin's uh, modernism. Um, and then uh, we also have performances by contemporary artists like Choi Kafai, which are coming up. And then we'll end in a, in a soiree of sorts uh, with a kind of a panel discussion, which will be convened uh, with poets uh, like Alfian Saad, uh, Edin Ko, uh, Pauline Fan, uh, amongst others. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Idana, yes. Can I, can I thank you and, uh, you know, the, all the museum for organizing this yeah. and also a special thanks to Gunawan, really. Yeah. It's such an honor for the two of us, Terry and I, to be um, placed to you, oh, you know. Fantastic. In my eyes, you are the ultimate wanderer, <laughs> the ultimate, <laughs> and, and perhaps one of the most courageous ones, too, in, mm. in my lifetime. So mm. thank you so much, really. And, well, uh, I'm flattered. <laughs> but, uh, let, let me thank Mustafa and please send my best regard to Latif. Yes, absolutely. No, we yeah. you can never forget Latif. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Latif, too. Right. Thank you.